have been uh, clearly quite significant changes in global order. They're underway right now. Uh, but before turning to them, I'd like to say just a word about the fact that uh, they may not continue for very long. Uh, there's an unfortunate reason. Uh, the reason you all know, I'm sure, uh, is that for the first time in human history, we are facing uh, realistic uh, questions of uh, species survival, at least in any decent form. Uh, that concern is not new, but unfortunately nothing much has been done about it. Uh, over half a century ago, uh, in July 1955, two of the greatest figures of the 20th century, Bertrand Russell and Albert Einstein, uh, issued an extraordinary appeal to the people of the world uh, to face a choice that, in their words, is stark and dreadful and inescapable. Shall we put an end to the human race or shall mankind renounce war? Uh, Russell and Einstein were, of course, thinking of nuclear war. Uh, there have been many very close calls since. It's kind of a miracle that the species has survived this far. Uh, and they continue, in fact, even in recent weeks. If there's time, I may say something about them. Uh, and there's a companion threat, which they didn't realize at the time, but it's now understood that's environmental disaster. It's a meeting in Bonn right now to that almost certainly will have no outcome that is supposed to deal with it. Uh, the uh, threat of environmental disaster was uh, highlighted by a report last week uh, from the International Energy Agency. The report was that uh, greenhouse gas emissions had increased by a record amount last year despite the recession and that the chances are now quite slim for holding global warming to uh, two degree Celsius level that's considered to be the threshold for really dangerous climate change, and we may have passed it. I'll return briefly to both of these matters, uh, merely noting that they cast a dark shadow over any discussion of global order. Well, let's put those grim prospects to the side and consider the evolving global order. Uh, one major theme uh, widely discussed is what's called American decline. It's real, but I think it's sometimes misinterpreted. It's commonly described as uh, another stage in a long-term shift of global hegemony from east to west, uh, crossing the Atlantic and now moving across the Pacific to the rising powers, uh, China and India. And their recent growth is indeed spectacular, uh, but I think this is an error of interpretation. And though there is a significant global shift, I think it may be different than this one. Well, proceeding to approach that, let's look back briefly to the evolution of the contemporary global order, beginning with World War II, when it made a huge change. Uh, the changes and continuities uh, since that time are uh, significant, uh, they're very real, and they're quite instructive. It's worth thinking about them. Uh, from the outset of the war in 1939, uh, Washington anticipated that the war would end uh, in, with the United States in a position of overwhelming power. Uh, there were high-level meetings right through the war, 1939 to 1945, uh, high level government officials and uh, non-governmental uh, foreign policy specialists. Uh, they met to lay out plans for the post-war world. Uh, they delineated what they called a grand area that uh, the U.S. was going to dominate. Uh, and it included the entire Western Hemisphere, uh, the entire Far East, uh, and the former British Empire, which the U.S. would take over, uh, including, crucially, its uh, 
uh, Middle East uh, energy reserves. Uh, as Russia began to grind down the Nazi armies after Stalingrad, a grand area planning changed. The goals expanded uh, to include as much of Eurasia as possible, uh, at least its economic core in uh, Western Europe. And within the grand area, uh, there were certain policies which still hold. I simply read them. Within the grand area, the United States would maintain unquestioned power with military and economic supremacy, and it would ensure the limitation of any exercise of sovereignty by states that might interfere with its global designs. Uh, these are doctrines that still prevail, though the ability to Im impose them has declined. It's very clear from the documentary record that uh, President Roosevelt was aiming at United States hegemony in the post-war world. I'm quoting the accurate assessment by one of the leading diplomatic historians, British historian Jeffrey Warner, one of the major specialists on the topic. And much more significant, the uh, careful wartime plans were very soon implemented in thoughtfully and in great detail. Uh, and it's not surprising that the U.S. had those plans. At that time, the United States was in a position of historically unprecedented power. It had literally 50% of the world's wealth had incomparable security. It controlled the Western Hemisphere, controlled both oceans, it controlled the opposite sides of both oceans. Uh, State Department planning, which was largely in the hands of George Kennan, the head of the State Department planning staff, uh, it assigned to each region of the world what they called its function. Uh, in Latin America, uh, the function was to fulfill the Monroe Doctrine of 1823. The doctrine announced that the U.S. would dominate the hemisphere, but couldn't be implemented at the time. The British were much too powerful. But after uh, the Second World War, you could implement the Monroe Doctrine. That was uh, our little region over here, as the Secretary of War, Henry Stimson, explained while demanding that all regional alliances be dismantled except for our own, which would be expanded. Uh, the function of Southeast Asia was to provide resources and raw materials to the former colonial masters. Uh, the United States had little interest in Africa at the time. So Kennan assigned Africa to Europe to exploit, it's his word, for Europe to exploit for its reconstruction. You could imagine a different relation between Europe and Africa in the light of history, but that wasn't considered. Uh, as for Europe itself, it was to be reconstituted, but in a very specific way. It was to be reconstituted only after labor and the left were uh, suppressed. That's the core of the anti-fascist resistance, of course. They had to be suppressed, and the traditional order had to be reestablished, including fascist collaborators. Uh, that sometimes requ required considerable violence, and large-scale subversion continued for many years. In Italy, it continued well into the 1970s. Uh, for Germany, uh, it was necessary, uh, I'm quoting, to veto uh, uh, the major union constitutions to forcefully terminate social experiments, to bar early co-determination efforts, and more generally to wall off the western zone from the east. That was Kennan's interesting phrase. Uh, planners were concerned that they would not be able to compete with uh, social and economic uh, uh, pressures coming from the East, so therefore uh, Western Germany had to be walled off. Uh, that meant left labor influences, and they were very explicit about it. Uh, 
then later came the Marshall Plan, which uh, doubtless uh, aided European reconstruction, but it had other goals as well. Uh, in reality, the Marshall Plan, if you look at what happened, it was very largely a taxpayer subsidy, U.S. taxpayer subsidy to U.S. businesses. Uh, most of the money never left the United States. And that's appreciated by the uh, beneficiaries in the United States, the domestic beneficiaries. So Ronald Reagan's uh, Commerce Department pointed out that, in their words, the Marshall Plan set the stage for large amounts of private U.S. direct investment in Europe, uh, laying the groundwork for the rise of multinational corporations at that time, almost all American. Uh, business Week, the main business journal, described multinational corporations as the economic expression of the political framework expressed by, established by post-war policymakers in which American business prospered and expanded on overseas orders, fueled initially by the dollars of the Marshall Plan and protected from negative developments by the umbrella of American power. That's 1975. Uh, it was always recognized that uh, Europe might choose to follow an independent course, perhaps along Gaullist lines. And uh, NATO was partially intended to counter that threat. And that was seen very clearly in, uh, when the, in 1989, 1990, when the official pretext for NATO dissolved. Uh, official pretext, NATO's there to protect Western Europe from the Russian hordes. No more Russian hordes. Uh, anyone who believed the propaganda of the preceding years should have expected that NATO would dissolve. Uh, on the contrary, it was expanded to the east in violation of very explicit pledges, but only verbal pledges to Gorbachev who was pretty upset when they were violated, but the Washington pointed out to him that the pledges weren't on paper. And if he was stupid enough to accept the gentleman's agreement, that's his problem. Uh, so in violation of the pledges, expanded to the east. And since then, it's been expanded well beyond. It's now a uh, officially a US-run global intervention force. Its official task is controlling the crucial infrastructure of the global energy system, uh, pipelines, sea lanes, and so on. Uh, nevertheless, uh, what's called American declinism set in very quickly. The grand area began to unravel very seriously by 1947 uh, with what's called the loss of China, uh, which is an interesting term. It's the term constantly used debates about who's responsible for the loss of China. And the phrase is worth thinking about. Uh, you can only lose what you possess. And legitimate ownership of uh, the world is just taken for granted. Uh, it's not surprisingly, given, given the scale of US power. Uh, Southeast Asia began to go the same way, first in Indochina, but much more seriously in Indonesia, a much more valuable prize. Uh, in 1958, President Eisenhower carried out the largest intervention uh, in post, in, since World War II. Uh, the goal was to support a military revolt at overthrowing the government. The idea was to split off the outer islands. That's where most of the rich resources are. That failed, but in 1965, there was a US-backed military coup in uh, Indonesia, which uh, installed the dictatorship of General Suharto. Uh, it carried it out with a staggering bloodbath that was a gleam of light in Asia, in the words of the New York Times. Uh, hundreds of thousands of people were slaughtered, mostly landless peasants, and the country was thrown open to Western exploitation. Euphoria in the West was virtually unconstrained. Uh, years later, 
that McGeorge Bundy, who was the national security advisor for Presidents Kennedy and Johnson, he reflected uh, in retrospect that the United States should probably have called off the Vietnam War in 1965, since the major objective had been achieved. Uh, the major objective, we know from declassified documents, was to prevent what's called the virus of independent nationalism from spreading contagion to the rest of the region, uh, possibly even Japan. It's called the super domino by the eminent Asia historian John Dower. Uh, the fear of contagion from uh, the virus of independent nationalism, that's the terminology later of Henry Kissinger, Nixon administration, and that's a leading theme of post-war history, one of the major themes, in fact. Well, our little region over here, Latin America, now that posed similar dangers early on. In 1954, uh, the United States overthrew the first democratic government in Guatemala, installed a brutal dictatorship that carried out uh, horrendous crimes, uh, ultimately a virtual genocide of the Mayans and the Highlands, the still fleeing to the United States, all with the strong support of the Reagan administration. But the contagion nevertheless spread. Uh, in 1962, President Kennedy shifted the mission of the Latin American military, which of course the United States can do. It shifted the mission from hemispheric defense, which was a kind of a holdover from World War II, to internal security. Internal security has a very definite meaning. It means war against the population, brutal war. And the consequences are described by uh, Charles Machling. He's the man who led counterinsurgency and uh, internal defense planning in the Kennedy and Johnson administrations. Uh, he described Kennedy's 1962 decision, I'll quote him, as a shift from toleration of the rapacity and cruelty of the Latin American military to direct complicity in their crimes to U.S. support for the methods of Heinrich Himmler's extermination squads. Uh, just recently, Cambridge University Press published uh, Academic History of the Cold War, uh, Latin American. One of the contributions is by Latin American scholar John, John Coatsworth, and he wrote, writes that from that time, the early 60s, to the Soviet collapse in 1990, quoting the numbers of political prisoners, torture victims, executions of nonviolent political dissenters in Latin America vastly exceeded those of the Soviet Union and its East European satellites, uh, all supported, uh, sometimes instituted by Washington. That included a long series of religious martyrs and mass slaughter as well. Uh, the last major violent act was uh, the, um, a week after the Berlin Wall fell, a brutal assassination of six leading Latin American intellectuals, Jesuit priests. Uh, the perpetrators were an elite Salvadoran battalion, which already had left a trail of thousands of brutally murdered victims. Uh, they had uh, just come from renewed training at the John F. Kennedy School of Special Warfare, uh, and they were acting on direct, we now know, on direct orders of the high command of the U.S. client state, which was in always close contact with Washington. Well, the consequences of this hemispheric plague uh, still, of course, reverberate. Uh, from the wartime years, in fact, since the dawn of the oil age, back during the First World War, uh, control of the Middle East was regarded as a very high priority. In President Eisenhower's judgment, the Middle East was the most strategically important area of the world. Uh, it was a stupendous source of strategic power, probably the richest economic prize in the world in the field of foreign investment. 
That's the judgment of the State Department in the 1940s. And that was a prize that the United States intended to keep for itself and its allies in the unfolding New World Order of that day. Well, problems also arose there very early in, in the oil producing regions. In 1953, uh, the United States and Britain uh, overthrew the parliamentary regime of uh, Prime Minister Mossadegh in Iran, installed the dictatorship of the Shah. And the, the general reaction of liberal intellectual elites was expressed very clearly by the New York Times editors. Uh, quote, underdeveloped countries with rich resources now have an object lesson in the heavy cost that must be paid by one of their number, which goes berserk with fanatical nationalism. Uh, it's too much to hope that Iran's experience will prevent the rise of Mossadegh's in other countries, but that experience may at least strengthen the hands of more reasonable and more far-seeing leaders who will have a clear-eyed understanding of the principles of decent behavior. Uh, decent behavior means you follow U.S. orders and you don't try to take over your own resources. Uh, that's the liberal progressive end of the spectrum, go to the right, it's harsher. Uh, consequences of that are too well known to review. Well, that's the merest sketch of uh, implementation of grand area policies in what's called the Global South. The preferred version of the post-war era, era is quite different. It's actually expressed quite well by the lead article in the current issue of uh, Britain's prime foreign policy journal, International Affairs. It discusses, I'll quote it, the visionary international order of the second half of the 20th century marked by the universalization of an American vision of commercial prosperity. Well, there's something to that account, but it does not quite convey the perception of those who are at the wrong end of the guns. Uh, and that's typical of Western ideological pronouncements called scholarship and journalism and so on. Uh, grand area doctrine restricts the sovereignty of others, but it grants the United States unrestricted rights. Among these is the right to carry out unilateral military intervention at will. And that doctrine has repeatedly been articulated, for example, by the Clinton administration. Uh, it explained that the U.S. has the right to use military force unilaterally to ensure, I'm quoting, uninhibited access to key markets, energy supplies, and strategic resources. And the U.S. must maintain military forces forward deployed in Europe and Asia in order to shape people's opinions about us not by handing out chocolate bars, and to shape events that will affect our livelihood and our security. And notice that, that the Clinton doctrine was considerably more extreme than the Bush doctrine. Uh, the Bush doctrine received a lot of criticism, but more because of the style and the content that Clinton presented it politely, you know, pleasant words and so on. Uh, the Bush administration presented it with extreme arrogance and European leaders don't like to be insulted. They don't mind the doctrine, in fact they accept it, but uh, present it to us politely, please. Uh, the same principles uh, govern the invasion of Iraq. Uh, after a few years, it was becoming quite clear that the United States was unable to uh, impose its will in Iraq. And at that point, the actual goals of the invasion uh, couldn't be uh, concealed any longer behind the usual pretty rhetoric. In November 2007, uh, the White House issued what they called a Declaration of Principles, which insisted that U.S. forces must remain indefinitely in Iraq, free to carry out combat operations, and that Iraq must privilege American investors. 
two months later, January 2008, the President Bush informed Congress that he would reject legislation that might limit the permanent stationing of Amer U.S. armed forces in Iraq or U.S. control of the oil resources of Iraq. Very explicit. All of this, of course, had been concealed before. You know, nice rhetoric about democracy, the usual. Now, these were demands that the United States had to abandon uh, in the face of Iraqi resistance. That was another step in a major defeat. It's quite unlike Vietnam, where the U.S. did achieve its major aims. That, as was recognized by McGeorge Bundy, for example. Well, throughout these years, dis despite many successes, American declinism continued. Uh, by 1970, the U.S. share of global wealth had declined to about 25 percent, still enormous, but much less than the post-war height of 50 percent. Uh, the other industrial powers had recovered uh, with considerable assistance from U.S. violence. So the Korean War was a major stimulus to Japan's recovery, uh, and uh, the Vietnam War gave it another significant boost. Uh, it also helped to spark South Korea's remarkable development from the level of a poor African state uh, to a leading industrial power. A substantial sh share of uh, South, of Korea, South Korea's foreign exchange in the 1960s came from mercenaries, vicious, brutal mercenaries that they were supply, uh, providing for the American war in Vietnam, hundreds of thousands of them. Uh, decolonization was proceeding following its agonizing course. Uh, by 1970, the industrial world <coughs> was described as bipolar, tripolar, three, uh, North America, Western Europe, and East Asia. At that time, Japan-based and already beginning to become the most dynamic industrial region of the world. Well, one revealing index of the decline of U.S. power is vetoes at the United Nations. Until 1965, there were none. The world was under control, and the UN, in fact, could be used as a weapon against the Soviet Union. Uh, since 1965, the United States is far in the lead in vetoes on a very wide range of issues. Britain is second, and no one else is even close. Uh, in the 1970s, there were also quite radical changes in the entire state capitalist system with the twin processes of uh, financialization of the economy and for the U.S. the offshoring of production. Uh, these effects have been substantial and they've contributed to a, a self-inflicted acceleration of American decline. I'll return to that. Uh, decline has continued in the new millennium. The very dramatic developments have taken place in our little region over here in the past decade. Uh, for the first time in 500 years since the uh, days of the European conquerors, the countries of South America have begun to deal with their terrible internal problems uh, ruled by a small, Europeanized, often white elite with enormous wealth. Uh, these are just little islands in a sea of miserable poverty. Uh, they've begun to deal with it. Uh, and they've also begun to move towards integration. And that's a prerequisite for independence. Uh, the U.S. has been expelled from all of its military bases in South America. Uh, one symbol of the uh, current developments is the formation of an organization, CELAC, which includes all states of the Western Hemisphere apart from the U.S. and Canada. Uh, that would have been unthinkable before. Its first meeting is scheduled uh, in a few weeks. And if it becomes operational, that'll be another step in undoing the Monroe Doctrine. Well, control of Latin America was always considered a cornerstone of global dominance. Uh, one 
dramatic moment was uh, under the Nixon administration when it was preparing for the overthrow of Chilean democracy. The National Security Council top planning board observed that if the United States could not control Latin America, it could not expect to achieve a successful order elsewhere in the world that is, to control the rest of the world. Uh, Washington's credibility would be undermined. As Henry Kissinger put it, he was planning the overthrow of the uh, democratic government. Uh, the concern, as Kissinger explained, was uh, that others too might separate themselves from U.S. control if the Chilean virus was not destroyed before it could spread contagion, his phrase. He was actually concerned uh, with Southern Europe. He thought there was a period of what was called Eurocommunism, kind of social democratic movements in Spain and Italy. And Kissinger was concerned that the Chilean virus might spread contagion there. He didn't expect the Chilean army to land in Rome, but he was afraid that the model might inspire others. Actually, Brezhnev shared that concern at the time for other reasons. Uh, therefore, parliamentary democracy in Chile had to go. Uh, that actually happened on what in Latin America is often called the first 9-11, September 11th, 1973. It's gone from history in the West, though in terms of the consequences for Chile and the whole region, it far outweighs the terrible crimes of what we call 9-11, September 11th, 2001. Well, important as uh, Latin America was for world control, it paled alongside the Middle East. I've already uh, mentioned some assessments of its significance at the dawn of the post-war age. Uh, despite all the changes since, it's, there's every reason to suppose that today's policymakers basically adhere to the judgment of very influential Roosevelt advisor, uh, A. A. Burley, who observed that control of the incomparable energy reserves of the Middle East would yield substantial control of the world. And correspondingly, uh, notice that that doesn't mean access to the resources. In fact, they didn't much care about that. It's control, a very different matter. Uh, correspondingly, the loss of that control would threaten the project of global dominance that was very clearly articulated during World War II and has been sustained in the face of major changes in world order ever since that day. But that's being threatened too. And right now, U.S. dominance in, um, in that region is under severe threat. That's the Arab Spring. Uh, the Arab world is beginning to move in the same direction as Latin America in the uh, past decade. Uh, that's the democratic uprising of the Arab Spring. And the U.S. and its Western allies are sure to do whatever they can to prevent authentic democracy in the Arab world. It's very important to understand and to understand why it's sufficient to uh, take a look at the studies of Arab public opinion. These are conducted by the most respected uh, U.S. polling agencies. In the United States, they're not reported at all. They're barely mentioned elsewhere. You can tell me whether they're reported here. But they're certainly known to planners. Uh, they reveal that by overwhelming majorities, uh, Arabs regard the United States and Israel as the major threats they face. Uh, 90% in Egypt, the most important country in the region. Now, there are some in the Arab world who think of Iran as a threat, 10%. Uh, opposition to U.S. policy is so strong that a majority in the Arab world believe that security would be improved if Iran had nuclear weapons to deter the United States. In Egypt, that's 80% of the population and other figures are pretty much similar. Well, the conclusion is that uh, if public opinion were to influence policy, as would happen if there's any 
serious move towards democracy, then the United States would not only con not control the region, but it would be expelled from it along with its allies. Now, that would undermine fundamental principles of global domination. Uh, the contempt of elite opinion for democracy was revealed very dramatically uh, in the reaction to the WikiLeaks exposures. Uh, the ones that received most attention, uh, euphoric commentary, uh, were cables reporting that Arabs support the U.S. stand on Iran. The reference was to the ruling dictators. The attitudes of the public were unmentioned. Uh, so it's enough if the dictators support us. It doesn't matter if the public is radically opposed. And there is a guiding principle that was articulated pretty clearly by the Middle East specialist of the Carnegie Endowment, Marwan Mouracher, who's formerly a high official of the Jordanian dictatorship. The principle is there's nothing wrong, everything's under control. In short, if the dictators support us and they control the population, nothing else can matter. That's the Western conception of democracy, very clearly exhibited. Uh, the Muwasher doctrine is rational and very venerable, uh, to mention just one case that's highly relevant today and ought to be taught to everyone in schools in the West. Uh, there was uh, internal discussion in 1958, President Eisenhower, and Eisenhower expressed concern about what he called the campaign of hatred against us in the Arab world, and not by governments, but by the people. And the National Security Council issued a memorandum explaining it. They, they said that there's a perception in the Arab world that the United States supports dictatorships and blocks democracy and development, and we do it in order to ensure control over their resources. And furthermore, they said the perception is basically accurate, uh, and that's exactly what we should be doing, relying on the Muasher Doctrine. As long as the dictators can keep the population under control, no matter what they think. If there's a campaign of hatred, who cares? Uh, after 9-11, uh, there were, um, uh, you may recall that George Bush, uh, president, plaintively pleaded that they hate our freedom, echoed by many intellectuals. Now, the government actually carried out a study, and it confirmed that they do not hate our freedom, they hate our policies, and with good reason, namely the ones that the National Security Council described in 1958. Uh, the truth of the matter is we hate their freedom, and with very good reason, uh, we being the governments of the West and elite opinion in the West. Well, in Egypt, uh, though the old regime still remains pretty much in place, there have been important victories. The press is far more free. Uh, labor organizing, which was brutally crushed under the Western-backed dictatorships, it now proceeds effectively. And the struggle for democracy is unabated. It's going on constantly. Uh, now poses serious threats to the United States and its Israeli client. Uh, for the first time in 30 years, Egypt has allowed Iranian ships to transit the Suez Canal into the Mediterranean, which is supposed to be an American lake. Actually, just yesterday, you may have read, uh, it was reported that Iranian submarines were allowed to transit uh, into the Mediterranean. Uh, Egypt is also planning to uh, exchange ambassadors with Iran for the first time. Uh, Egypt has partially opened the Gaza border. Uh, if that proceeds, it breaks the U.S.-Israeli siege, uh, which is designed to keep the people of Gaza at the barest level of survival. Uh, Egypt has also brokered an agreement between Hamas and Fatah two major Palestinian factions, uh, that interferes with U.S.-Israeli policies that go back 20 years to separate Gaza and the West Bank. It's an explicit violation of the Oslo Accords, but the purpose is to undermine the prospects for a viable Palestinian state. Well, there's something more threatening in the background. Uh, 
the Egyptian public is strongly opposed to the way the 1979 Egypt-Israel Treaty has been interpreted by the U.S.-backed dictators, uh, articulating the Western interpretation of the treaty. The New York Times describes it as a cornerstone of the region's stability. That's true only if we understand the term stability in a, the technical sense of foreign policy discourse. It means conformity to U.S. demands. That's a standard usage. Uh, in reality, it's a cornerstone of the region's instability. It was understood at once uh, by uh, uh, that the effect of the Egyptian defection, as it was called, would be to free Israel to sustain military operations against the Palestinian or organizations in Lebanon, as well as settlement activity in the West Bank. I'm quoting one of Israel's leading strategic analysts, Avner Yaniv. And it's obvious, you remove the Egyptian deterrent, the only major deterrent in the Arab world, can proceed to do what you like. Uh, and in fact, Israel at once prepared to invade Lebanon, as it did in 1982, with strong support from the Reagan administration, killed maybe 20,000 people, destroyed much of the country. It sought to establish a puppet regime, uh, didn't quite succeed, uh, and the purpose was to consolidate control over the West Bank. And that was frankly admitted, there was no security concern. Uh, also, settlement in the occupied territories, all illegal, proceeded very rapidly. Uh, and the problem is that further progress in, toward democracy in Egypt might seriously threaten the form of so-called stability that the U.S. seeks to impose. Well, as I mentioned, Arab public opinion strongly supports an Iranian nuclear weapons program, but that doesn't mean that we should do so. It could be extremely dangerous. And if you read the foreign policy literature, or even the press, it's full of proposals as to how to deal with this potential threat. Uh, one proposal is studiously ignored, the one that's very strongly favored by most of the world. Namely, establish a nuclear weapons-free zone in the Middle East. Now, that issue regularly arises at the uh, uh, regular meetings, the conferences of the Non-Proliferation Treaty Conference every five years. Last one was at the UN headquarters in New York last year. Uh, at that point, Egypt was the chair of the 118 nations of the non-aligned movement. It's most of the world. Uh, they proposed that the conference call for negotiations on a Middle East nuclear weapons-free zone. Now, that had been formally agreed by the West, including the United States, at the 1995 review conference, but they didn't do anything about it. Well, international support last year was so overwhelming that the Obama administration formally had to agree uh, while saying, fine idea, but not now. Uh, furthermore, they insisted that Israel be exempted. And of course, the U.S is uh, self-exempted from international obligations in quite interesting ways, which are not well understood. Uh, Washington informed the conference uh, that no proposal, quoting it now, no proposal can call for Israel's nuclear program to be placed under the auspices of the International Atomic Energy Agency, and no proposal can call for release of information about Israeli nuclear facilities and activities, including information pertaining to previous nuclear transfers to Israel. Well, so much for a nuclear weapons-free zone. Uh, that's one of the many ways in which uh, the threat of nuclear war is being advanced uh, right now. It's worth bearing in mind how isolated the United States and its allies are on Iran. Uh, the non-aligned countries, again, most of the world, uh, for years they've been vigorously endorsing Iran's right to pursue uranium enrichment. 
Uh, the Arab world, as I mentioned, even wants them to go on to nuclear weapons. Now, the most important country in the region, Turkey, is improving commercial relations with Iran, a very natural trading partner, and it's announced, announced plans to triple its relations. Now, the most respected country of the global south, Brazil, has also strongly supported Iran's position. Now, that's most of the world. Well, uh, the United States can tolerate uh, Turkish and Brazilian disobedience, though with dismay, uh, but China is harder to ignore. Uh, the press warns, I'm quoting the New York Times, that China's investors and traders are now filling a vacuum in Iran as businesses from other countries, especially in Europe, pull out. The Europe is obedient to U.S. orders, but China isn't. These sanctions have absolutely no status. Those are unilateral U.S. sanctions. Uh, China does observe the UN sanctions, but that's because they're toothless. Uh, the issue has to do with the unilateral US sanctions. Uh, in particular, China's expanding its uh, dominant role in Iran's energy industry. Well, Washington is very upset, and they're reacting with a touch of desperation. The State Department issued a warning to China that if it wants to be accepted in the international community, that's another technical term like stability. The international community means the United States and anybody who happens to be going along with it at the moment. Uh, so if they want to be accepted in the international community, uh, then China must not skirt and evade international responsibilities, which are clear, namely follow U.S. orders. Uh, as I said, China does accept the relatively toothless U.N. sanctions, but it ignores the unilateral U.S. sanctions. It's therefore undermining stability in the technical sense. It's an illegitimate exercise of sovereignty in violation of grand area principles. I need not say that China's quite unimpressed by the stern warning. You know, their picture is, uh, we've been around for 3,000 years uh, disregarding the barbarians and will continue. Uh, and, and that's very disturbing to the United States. Well, the hegemonic doctrines that were formulated during World War II, they still prevail, but the cap capacity to implement them is declining uh, as the world is becoming more diverse, more independent. But there are also, as I mentioned, there are domestic factors contributing to America's decline. The society is being quite consciously undermined at home by the people who Adam Smith called the masters of mankind, those who control the economic system. No time to go into the details, but since the uh, sharp economic shift towards financialization and offshoring of production in the 1970s, a, a variety of factors have converged to create a vicious cycle of radical concentration of wealth, uh, mostly in the top 1%, one percent, one-tenth of one percent, actually, uh, of the population, such a small group that's not even picked up by census figures. Now, that's where the heavy Inequality, extreme inequality is coming from. Now, that means uh, CEOs, you know, directors of corporations, uh, hedge fund managers, and so on. Uh, their activities are of little, if any, benefit to the economy. They're probably harmful to it. Uh, uh, but that's where the economic power is concentrated. And concentration of economic power translates at once to concentration of political power. It's another point emphasized by that dangerous radical Adam Smith, who we're supposed to worship but not read, too dangerous to read him. Uh, he pointed out that uh, in his day, speaking of England, the merchants and manufacturers were the masters of mankind, and they were also the principal architects of policy. They made sure that their own interests were very well served, uh, no matter how grievous the effect on others, including the people of England. Well, that was the 1770s, and that principle remains. Uh, the concentration of uh, 
economic and with it political power has led to state policies that are designed to increase the concentration. Uh, fiscal policies, uh, rules of corporate governance, deregulation, uh, a lot more. Uh, meanwhile, the costs of electoral campaigns have skyrocketed. That has a very clear effect. It drives both political parties uh, deeper into the pockets of concentrated capital, increasingly financial capital. And for the Republicans, this is reflexive. Uh, the, the Democrats are not far behind. What are, there's a lot of commentary about the disappearance of moderate, moderate Republicans. That's not quite accurate. They're still there. They're now called Democrats. Uh, everything has shifted so far to the right that uh, mm -hmm. old-fashioned moderate Republicans are now the leading Democrats. In fact,